You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as she interviews others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpaused their life. Now here's your host, Dr. Kelly Estes. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy the Addictions Coach, and Rehab Rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. You are listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. I am the CEO and founder of the Addictions Academy, the largest online school for addiction studies. We're in 23 countries and five languages, and also CEO and founder of the Addictions Coach and now Fixed Failure to Launch. I am very excited for my guest today because he's very similar to me. He's all over the place and has done so many things with his life, and it's so awesome. I want you to welcome Thomas Shanahan, and he is an attorney out of New York, known for his civil rights work. He is also the author and president of Spiritual Adrenaline, which is a fantastic book that just came out. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you so much, Dr. Estes, for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you're here. You have energy like I do. You're like on 11, which is awesome. (laughs) Hopefully, we're both putting it to a good use. I think we are. I think we are. I think so. so. Let's start here. So you're an attorney in New York working with people, and then all of a sudden you write a book like on fitness and adrenaline and spirituality, which is like polar opposite of what you do. So let's start right. with what you did first. Tell me about being an attorney. Tell me what you do, how it's different, because you know the show is all about people that have done something unique and awesome. Tell mm-hmm. us what mm-hmm. makes you unique and awesome. Wow. Thank you for saying I'm unique and awesome. Let's see, let, awesome. Let's see if you think so after, uh, after we're done, but I appreciate that. You know, I, I, my original, uh, area of interest was television. I was working in television after I got out of college and, uh, my boss, who was a very, very nice lady who worked incredibly hard at a major television network that will remain nameless, was fired wrongfully. She was terminated, uh, based on, and I was not. She was terminated, but it had to do with her race. And, um, you know, uh, I was given a promotion and moved to another unit. But I remember being in my early 20s saying, boy, that was really unfair what happened to that person. Um, there wound up being a lawsuit over it. And they wound up settling that. But I said, you know, it's really that's not that's not justice. So, you know, that's what happened was wrong. And so I actually applied to law school. I was very active in politics and community affairs my whole life. And I went to New York Law School. And like I said, that that incident with my my boss was a big impetus for that. And then after law school, you know, um, I got out. I was working part time for then public advocate Mark Green. Uh, while I was in law school, I worked for Mayor David Dinkins as well. So I went part time, and I was working for elected officials here in New York. And I wanted to represent people as an attorney in civil rights that weren't necessarily didn't have access equal access to attorneys at that time and I picked the transgender and this was back in the early uh, late 1990s I, I graduated from law school in 1997 and there were no private attorneys in New York City that would represent the transgender so I decided I was going to start doing that and specializing in LGBT rights but with a focus on transgender and so I brought a whole number of cases against uh, at that time Verizon was Bell Atlantic I brought a case against Bell Atlantic for not allowing transgendered escorts to advertise they allowed all kinds of other escorts to advertise except the transgendered. Huh. And we were able to get that changed. I represented uh, a transgender, uh, someone named Amanda Lapore, who's very well known, who worked at a very uh, large nightclub here in New York when they fired her and said, we're letting you go because we want to hire real women. Uh, we wow. have hundreds of people. Hold yeah, yeah. That's but- what they said. That's what they said. But you see, at that time, wow. in the late 1990s, people yeah. actually thought, It was okay. It was the last group that you could actually discriminate against Mm -hmm. where everyone would look the other way because of who they were. So in that case, 
we had hundreds, there's a video on my, on my YouTube channel, hundreds of LGBT activists showed up at the nightclub at two in the morning. And it was just an amazing, amazing outpouring of support for Amanda. And, you know, we, that club went out of business and we wound up not being able to collect on a judgment, but we got a judgment against the club and its owners for a couple hundred thousand dollars. So that was a really big deal. And then the big case uh, that happened back then, which helped, you see, when I was doing this litigation, Christine Quinn was then very active in the New York City Council, and she became the speaker, but she introduced the bill, and she was fighting and lobbying very hard for a bill to uh, add transgendered people, gender identity, to the New York City human rights law. And so while I was litigating, people like Christine Quinn and others were advocating in the political arena. So we we're dual tracking this whole civil rights movement that was happening in the city. And the big case, and actually the day that the jury came back on this case was the same day that um, human rights bill was was amended in the city council just by chance. They happened on the same day. Uh, the big case back then was against Toys R Us. And it was a three employees who were working at the Bensonhurst Toys R Us who actually chased my client clients. There was three of them. They were shopping for Christmas presents. They chased them out of the Toys R Us with and they had bats. They had taken bats from the sporting section and they were saying, Get out of the store, you she males, you know, what? you know, man really? woman. Yes, yes. And there, you can Google this, you'll oh find my God. You'll find we had rallies in front of the Times Square Toys R Us store. What the hell? Uh, like, <laughs> hang on, hang on. You but, can't make this shit let, up. Like so let, no, no, let, and let me tell you, there's, and let me tell you, Dr. Arcee, you're not going to believe this, but there's a quote, if you Google any of the articles about the case, the defense that Toys R Us raised in federal court in the Eastern District, we were before Judge Sifton, was given who they are and what they look like, things are going to happen to them as they go about their business in the rough, mean streets of New York City. What That's the this is Manhattan. Defense. This is not the rough streets of me. I lived in the kitchen. <laughs> There's no yeah, time is not rough, first of all. <laughs> so and I know where the time for us was. What in the hell? Like they, you know, they, they, they had an attitude that, you know, transgendered could be discriminated against. They lost. We went to a jury trial. It was the very first jury trial ever in the country and on, involving transgendered uh, plaintiffs and we won. Wow, uh, and congratulations. We wound up getting $197,000. So it was an expensive lesson for Toys R Us to learn, you know. Right. And from there, I continued to do civil rights cases. Uh, my, the big, big case that I'm really well known, there's actually two of them. One was uh, with, he used to be the, uh, he was then state senator. He became the attorney general of New York, Eric Schneiderman. He and I sued the MTA uh, many years ago when they raised the subway and bus fares. And we we were able to show to a judge that they had lied to New Yorkers about their, their budget uh, problems. And so the judge ordered the MTA to reverse a fare increase on the subways and buses. And it was an amazing case. And as I was, after it was announced publicly, everybody in New York City was so excited about it. Everywhere I went, people were hugging, <laughs> hugging me. <laughs> like, you know, thank you so much. And, you know, and that was a really big case. And then one other one, uh, there's actually two, but one involved, another case involved uh, the rebuilding of the, the World Trade Center. And when the, the original plans for the Freedom Tower and the redevelopment site did not live, it was not up to the international building and fire codes. They failed to comply with the, the safety codes that were recognized nationally and internationally as important and uh, as you know, state of the art. And so uh, they said, we're the Port Authority. We don't have to comply. We can do what we want. So I represented the New York City uh, Fire Officers Association, which were all the firefighters, the senior firefighters. And I represented 20 families of victims of 9-11. And we sued not for money. We sued to compel the Port Authority to rebuild the new Freedom Tower and site in compliance with the International Building and Fire Codes. And the reason it's important is when the buildings were attacked, the old buildings did not comply. They were built a long time before, but they had stairwells in the same areas of the buildings, right, the towers. So when when the, the, the plane hit and the, the fire started, the explosion started, there was no way down because all the means of egress were, were, were damaged right. and no one could get down. And so the new international building codes have, you know, a stairwells in the opposite sides of the building and are, you know, they're the standard of care in these days. And the Port Authority, the original plans did not comply with, with those, those safety standards. And so our lawsuit, we wound up 
getting into negotiations with the Port Authority. And based on our lawsuit, who a mayor, the mayor at the time said there's there's uh, there's merit to this lawsuit. They they willingly sat down with uh, New York City Fire Department and other entities, and they wound up changing the plans for the development sites. So the case was withdrawn, but the intention was to bring public awareness to what was happening down there on behalf of families that already lost, you know, members in in the attack, and also the firefighters, because the New York City firefighters' position was, if they're not going to build the buildings to the highest possible safety codes and compliance with the international standards, right. you know, we have to go in those buildings. We shouldn't have to go with ourselves. Right. That you're not going to do. Right. And so, yeah, so that's a case that I'm really, really proud of as well, you know. And so I did cases like that from, uh, in addition to representing, you know, regular litigants. I had a specialty in women, <clears throat> women who were you know, usually involved in domestic violence type situations and they were getting divorced. I would handle the divorce in their custody cases and I had a number of cases that were national news you know, involving, you know, custody. And I still, to this day, represent mostly women, although some men, in you know, some of those custody cases. And, you know, they're tough cases, you know. But I think um, it's real important for for kids to be with the parent that nurtures them, the one that, you know, uh, raises them. And I just feel that there's a lot of problems in the court system and when it comes to these, these really high-conflict divorces that involve young kids and oftentimes involve very wealthy men and very powerful men and very successful men who have the money to really try and grind down the uh, their soon-to-be ex and oftentimes who use the children as kind of like, a, you know, Pons. as a trophy, if you will, yeah. or a pawn. Yeah. yeah, and that happens all the time. So I do speak. This is a conference. It was just this past weekend. I didn't speak this weekend, but I've spoken many times. Uh, it's, an, it's an annual thing here in New York at the Battered Women's Conference, which brings together many, many women from around New York State and actually from around the country as well to talk about these types of issues. And it's uh, Mo Hanna is the organizer, and she's out of Siena College in Albany, New York. And so I think it's important to help and to be available to them whenever they ask me. So that gives you my background. You know, that's, that's what I did in uh, my professional career. That's awesome. So, okay, so you've got like two sides here. So you have this professional person that comes in, you're like the archangel, you save people, you fix things, you make things. <laughs> right, right. Right? And then yeah. I know you from the other side, which is spiritual adrenaline. I didn't even know you right. were attorney until I saw your bio come through. I'm like, wait, what? So yeah. tell me yeah. about how did you get, what is the spiritual adrenaline? What does it mean? Okay. How did you get involved in the <laughs> that kind of stuff? Sure. Okay. Um, so, you know, all the time I'm, I'm doing all these great things, right? I mean, I was very successful in my career, uh, and I, things were going very well. And But the reality was I also was a really heavy drinker. I'd been a heavy drinker in high school uh, that, where I grew up in New York City because I did grow up here. You know, part of, like, the cool kid thing was to be at keg parties in the woods and blah, blah, blah. So I, I drank a lot uh, growing up in high school, then in college, the same thing. And then in college, I was introduced to harder drugs like cocaine and, and that kind of stuff. You know, I stopped doing drugs when I got out of college, but I always drank really heavily. And then working in politics, um, believe there's a lot of dysfunction in politics. And so really? there wait, were plenty. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Really? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm telling you something you don't know. It was, had, it was crazy. I had my first politician four years ago, and we did the sober on demand. So I flew to D.C., and I get there. You know, and I'm right next to the White House. I'm, you know, and I'm back and forth between there and the Capitol building, and I'm working with this guy, and everything that came out of his mouth was a lie. And I sat him down, and I'm like, dude, listen, I totally get for your for your job function, your job is to lie. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help you get sober if, you, if you're lying yeah. to me, because I can look at you and tell you yep. you just got high, and you're telling yep. me no, and the little drug test tells me yes. You know, I'm I'm not going to believe you. So. Yeah. That whole group yeah. of people, that's a whole other ball of wax. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's sad because I think I, when I watch the news now, I see a lot of, I, I, I just, to me, I can understand why things are so chaotic in Washington because I just know whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be food, whether it be uh, other things, there's so much dysfunction in the, in that world. And so I was part of that world. And, you know, there's every night of the week, there's a different function you have to be at and there's drinking involved and all kinds of things. And so, you know, I had been become a heavy drinker and um, that was true for most of my adult life. And then a whole host of things happened. You know, I was appointed to a very high level position in the Spitzer administration when Elliot Spitzer was governor. He wound up being caught, you know, with a, um, a prostitute 
No. He was called client number nine. And so there was a whole host of things that happened. And there was a lot of people who were collateral damage. You know, so David Patterson came in. There was this new investi- uh, attorney, uh, the inspector general appointed uh, because they said that the, the former inspector general was very close to the governor. And that person targeted me um, for investigation along with other people for lots of different reasons. And what happened was he wound up, after t- uh, investigating me for two years, didn't really find anything. I I was never directed or arrested or convicted. I was never told to return money, but he went through all my travel vouchers and found mistakes. And he put out a very damning press release. So I was asked to resign. I said, I'm not going to resign because what, what you're doing is crazy. This, it was crazy. And so I said, you can fire me. So I, you know, and they wound up firing me because I didn't want to admit that I had done anything in, in, wrong. So that happened. It was very public. It was in the papers all around New York state. And, you know, that was a lot. And then after, I didn't go back to drinking because I knew that I, I had a propensity to use alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism. So I actually went to an um, outpatient facility and I checked myself in as a preventive thing. And I was in that in that facility. I actually was very depressed, Dr. Essies. I will tell you, I was very upset about what happened because it was public and it was humiliating. Um, but I wasn't drinking or doing drugs. And I went to go see a therapist and he gave me like, I was there for 15 minutes, and I'm not exa- I'm not exaggerating. He was a pharmacologist who was recommended by someone I met at the outpatient uh, treatment facility, and I was there with him for 15 minutes. And he gave me like um, five different prescriptions: you know, anti-anxiety medication, sleeping medication. What else? I can't remember. There was five of them all together. And so I was in the outpatient program, and I was taking these the, the antidepressants and the anti-anxiety medication, and everything else, and then. Back to back, uh, in January 2010, my, my colleague, who I still share office space with now, her son, who was 18 years old, was paralyzed from the neck down in a snowboarding accident. Uh, she immediately wanted to leave and help with him with therapy, and she did. I told her I'd cover her, her, her law practice while she was gone so she wouldn't lose her business. So she left. I was covering her law practice, dealing with my law practice as well. And then um, two months later, on March 6, 2010, my brother, he's not my brother by blood, he's my cousin, but my mom and dad raised him. He was paralyzed from the neck down in a ski accident, believe it or not. Uh, and, and yeah, I know. And Sunday River up in Maine. So all of a sudden, I became really actively involved in his day-to-day financial affairs, his day-to-day health affairs. He had three kids, but they were in their early 20s, and they couldn't handle being around the, the, their father with this catastrophic uh, injury. And so, I mean, on a daily basis, I was dealing with things up in Maine. I was flying back and forth quite a bit. He went to therapy in Atlanta, so I would fly down to Atlanta and spend some time with him and come back up, try a case. It was just crazy. And then two months later, my mom, who had never been sick, never smoked a cigarette in her life or drank alcohol, got throat cancer. And uh, my sister was a wonderful human being, had three young kids at that time and just could not help in taking my mom to chemo and radiation. So I started going back and forth to Albany to take my mom to chemo and radiation. Then I'd come back and try and you know work down here and make money. It was just chaotic. I dropped out of the uh, outpatient clinic and I stopped um, – Stopped using all the medication because I didn't like the way it made me feel, like cold turkey. And so I basically couldn't function at all. And I had all these responsibilities. So I was like, you know, I went back to what I knew would work. And I went to my uh, Coke dealer. <laughs> I knew from like the, the old days. That was my solution. Hey, uh, you're already on 11 sober. I can't see you on cocaine, for God's sake. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. Uh, Even back then, people would say that to me. But you have to understand, I was so unhappy and so exhausted. It it became, it wasn't like uh, I was going uh, out to party and do it. I was trying to, like, keep up with the demands being placed on me. I would start doing it, which was crazy, um, almost at the time I got out of bed. And I needed, it got to the point, because I came off those um, the antidepressants and the other drugs, it, like, I needed it to function. And then, like, I, it's kind of reversed, because originally I would drink a lot and then go and use cocaine, but then the cocaine became, if you will, the gateway drug, and I needed, like, Jack Daniels to bring me down, because I couldn't sleep. See, I totally, it was just, I totally get that, because my drug of choice was Rip Fuel, if you remember back in the day, Mahawang, Garana, and a Fedra stack. And uh-huh, sure. Uh-huh. Stuff. I would, I would lay, lay in bed, 
take two, wait for it to hit, and bam, hit the ground running. We're going to do this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> And that led to speed when they when they said no more. I was like, what do you mean no more? Yeah. Like, you can't buy it. So now it's like, well, what's next? So mine's a little, you know, do speed because I was like, I really don't want to get into meth because then I'm not going to be functioning at all. So mm-hmm, I totally mm-hmm. get that. And the, you know, harder things in life get, the more you reach for something. So yeah, yeah, yep. yep. that's what happened. That? How did you? Well, you know, I got to remember. Let me just say also one other funny thing about it. Like, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but I know this now. Is that aside from dentists, lawyers have one of the highest. I think the second suicide? highest level. Uh, suicide, but also substance abuse yeah. problems. The, the, the numbers, and it's a very you know. So I wasn't alone. <laughs> I knew, you know, uh, in the courthouse. I mean, I hate to say this, but there was a lot of people, and, and I still see people that are struggling. It's just the dynamic of of the job. It's a very, very uh, it, it, mentally grueling job. And so the point is, it was awful. Um, you know, it got to the point where my colleague came back after one year off of taking care of her son. Her son, by the way, just graduated from NYU. He never, he was, he still uses the wheelchair, but he recovered greatly because she took that year off. Right. And he just graduated from NYU as a psychology major. Um, but so she came back and she saw what, because she was with me every day, how bad things were when she came back and she talked to my mom because she's part of the family. So next thing you know, in May, I wound up in an inpatient facility, you know, and when I got there, I was very sick. On the way there, I wound up stopping at a cardio, uh, what do you call it, a heart unit in a, in a local hospital because uh, they were concerned I might have had like a, a stroke or something. So I was there for a couple of days and then I wound up being admitted to a place called Conifer Park, which is in Albany, New York. And, you know, I just, I was happy I was there. I felt like things had gotten out of hand. I didn't know how to get out of it. So I felt like this instead of being like uh, unhappy to be there, I was thrilled. You want to know the truth? And I, I had been through like when I was in the outpatient program, I was going to the program and I would go to meetings, talk to meetings, but I would not participate. I would just sit in the back of the room. Um, I had a sponsor who actually didn't work steps, so he didn't make me work steps. And I would text, you know, I didn't change any of the people, places and things. And obviously when everything happened, those the, the major things the next year, you know, I completely imploded. So I'm, I didn't really have a recovery that was based on a strong foundation or really any foundation. So when I was an inpatient, I just started, you know, really focusing and I said, I'm going to do everything they tell me to do and more instead of trying to be in with the cool patients, the cool kids. I decided I want to be in with the ones who were not cool because they were doing the work. I didn't want to come back and do it again. And so I really embraced recovery and I learned from doing things the wrong way, you know, going to meetings and not participating, how to do things the right way. And so I started, you know, really focusing on that. Long story short, I went into rehab at 140. I came out at 177 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. And in the first uh, six months of my sobriety, I continued to add weight. I continued, people would tell me, you know, it's okay, don't worry about it, easy does it, it's your first year. And that's true to some extent, but I started to really smoke more in early recovery than I did at the end of my active addiction or during my years of addiction. I was putting on weight, I just wasn't happy, and I wasn't feeling good. I felt like my brain and the 12 steps were were working, the 12 steps were working phenomenally for my brain and to get me mentally focused and, and kind of really engaged. And I was actually quite happy. But physically, my body wasn't. I was actually doing the opposite of my body. And I started to really realize, like, I would hang around with people who would smoke before the meetings. Then we'd take cigarette breaks during the meetings. The first thing I'd do after would be to light up a cigarette. And I continued to smoke most of the day. And also that, like, when I would, when I wouldn't eat right, and then I would drink coffee with lots of sugar. And so I just realized this was not sustainable. And I felt that it was actually undercutting my chances of staying sober in the long run. And so I, that's when I decided, I took a year off from practicing law. I worked part-time, actually, after I got out of the outpatient. And so I decided I really wanted to learn more about nutrition and exercise, so I did. I became a personal, <clears throat> I got certified as a personal trainer uh, two or three years uh, after I got out of that rehab. Uh, I did, you know, part-time. I became, I got certified in nutrition as a sports nutritionist, and I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition to get a, an overview of different dietary theories. And so I started to integrate exercise and nutrition into the 12 steps. So I started to apply the steps to exercise and nutrition. And for me, that was an amazing experience and it continues to be. So I'm just going to stop you right there. So that for me 
is so pivotal because there's people out there who find sobriety and they say, okay, I'm not using heroin, alcohol, whatever, but I turn around and they're eating donuts, they're eating cupcakes, they're not working <laughs> exactly. out, they're unhappy, they're bitching about everything, and I'm like, okay, well, but you're not sober. And we have this big debate. Mm-hmm. They go, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, sugar's a drug. Sugar pings your brain like cocaine and detoxes you like heroin, so if you're going to eat yep. that Snickers bar and then tell me how clean you are, you and I are going to rumble because you're not clean. <laughs> I got- there's a big difference between abstinence and sobriety. I'm 100% with you, right? right. Yep, and then on top of that, people say to me, well, I'm clean and sober, but they're on Facebook, you know, starting an argument, or calling people names, <laughs> and I'm like, you're not recovered, yeah. because that, okay, you yeah. might not be doing heroin today, but you're still an asshole. So, yep. when I work with people, I say, it's it's not just stop using this substance, but you have to figure out the why. Why am I mm-hmm. drinking? Why am I doing drugs? Why am I reaching for the Snickers bar instead of the apple? Whatever it is, mm-hmm. whatever your vice is, figure it out, solve it, and then move forward. So. I'm, when I work with clients, they come off sugar, they come off white flour, and their ass is in the gym. And they get so mad at me, they're like, well, this isn't what I signed up for. Yes, it is. This is what we're going to do. We're going to fix everything. So, Well, you know, you're, you're 100% on the money. I didn't realize you integrate. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't realize you did that, and that, that, that makes sense now to me. That makes oh, yeah. sense now. And what are your success rates when you do that? We're 99% successful. But here's the yeah, thing. I would imagine. Yep. I don't take everybody. And I tell them flat flat out, I won't take you if I think you're going to fail because that's a reflection of me. So yeah. you have to be 100% committed to all of this. And people say, well, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm gluten-free. I'm sugar-free. I have to. I don't have an option. So mm-hmm. you have to treat this just like everything else. It's a lifestyle. It's not a diet. You have to work out. I work out six out of the seven days a week. And Mm -hmm. you have to be committed because if you're not committed, your whole mindset is based upon what you eat. And people don't understand Mm -hmm. that. I'm like, if you eat eat a bagel, you're going to look like a bagel and you're going to feel like crap. (laughs) That's it. A hundred percent. Let me just say, too, what you're saying, you know, it sounds so like revolutionary in the context of the the, like the environment around 12 step recovery and recovery in general. But it's common sense. And, you know, in the book, and I have a whole chapter in my book on this topic because, you know, people were saying, oh, you're attacking the 12 steps. You're this. I said, no, I'm not. I'm a big believer in, in the 12 steps. You know, I was granted access to uh, World AA's World Services Research Library. I also had some access up at Stepping Stones. And, you know, what was really interesting to me was that Dr. Bob and Bill W., all, all, all the early founders of the 12 step movement recognize that what you're saying is 100% true, Dr. Estes, and that, you know, that the foods that people ate you know, had a direct impact on their ability to stay sober. They came up with this list. They called these the sister foods to alcohol, refined sugar, soda, white bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, and french fries. And so those are the, the foods that the founders of the 12 step movement originally recommended people stay away from in early recovery. And so I say this because there's a lot more of the research in that chapter of the book, but it's not revolutionary. It's completely consistent with, you know, with science now and and, and the founding of the 12 steps. And I think it's important because you, I didn't realize you integrated into when you're working with your client. Now I understand why, because I did realize that you had a very high success rate. Now I understand why, because I just feel for whatever the reasons, oftentimes um, the culture that's developed around certain recovery communities is completely inconsistent with the fundamental purpose of the community. And so, you know, it, it's inc- it's incredibly important. It was incredibly important for me to change because I knew that I wouldn't be able to make it in the long term if I had made those changes. And that's why I wrote the book because I was looking for like a one stop. When I was trying to put all these pieces together, I couldn't find something. I didn't have a lot of money, couldn't go to a personal trainer, you know, aside from taking the courses I mentioned earlier, it was very hard to really be able to fund this, especially because you know, in early recovery, it was like paying off taxes, it was paying off debt, this, that, this, that. And so I, I realized how difficult it can be for someone to put all the pieces together. And so that's why I wrote a book that talks about basic exercise science, basic nutrition science, basic hormones, vitamins, and minerals, and put it all into a step format that people can follow because I just think it's a successful way to integrate these things into their lives. 
And that's what we're doing. And I mentioned to you earlier, uh, in May of this year, 2019, uh, WPIX Television here in New York City is going to be following three people who've agreed to follow the lifestyle. These are people who have been in long-term recovery and all have put on substantial weight, all feel unhealthy in how they live, except for the fact that they've abstained from their drugs of choice and all want something different because they're just not happy. In fact, one of them said to me, you know, uh, the, the option for him at this point after five years, he's so miserable in the sober lifestyle he's developed for himself that if he couldn't find a way to change it up, he was going to go back to drinking because he said, why should I be sober and miserable? So I told him, I said, don't go back to drinking. Give it a shot and come and do this. I call it the Spiritual Adrenaline Challenge. I'm really excited to see how these two, three people, you know, how things change for them. I hope and I believe in a positive way by investing six months with us and trying to change the lifestyle they're living. That's excellent. And I'm, I'm really excited for this, too, because I think this is a book that I can integrate. We teach fitness and recovery and nutrition and recovery. I know you do. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So be prepared. I know you, but listen, can I give you, and I'm not just giving you, uh, I'm not plugging you because you had me on. I'm really excited to be here and I'm honored to be here, but you're one of the few. You know, when I look at the programs, I, I've looked at what you teach and you're one of the few who gets it in the sense you, what you offer at the Addictions Academy is like, a, a, it's a rounded, holistic approach, right? It's not just reg, like kind of, um, uh, piecemeal you take the whole person and i think that's that that you deserve a lot of credit for that we're, we're bringing on a lot of we're bringing on darren little john for buddhist 12 step i read his book the 12 step to i just had him on before you today oh did you really oh, yeah i read his book years ago i yep. love that book so he's the 12 buddhist on. steps yep yep mm-hmm. and um valerie mason john gabor mate's right hand she does the eight steps for buddhist recovery so we're going to bring both of them on for the spiritual side because we have the fitness, we have the nutrition, we have the recovery coaching, life coaching, we have all these pieces. Now it's the spiritual mm-hmm. side because there's nowhere to go. Like you said, you, you were looking around going, what do I do? There's no fitness in recovery. There wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah, there's no nutrition. Yeah. You have nutritionists who go, well, I don't know what to tell you about that. And then they don't understand the whole concept, you know, of alcoholism and drug addiction mm-hmm. and your cravings and your triggers. And it's like a disconnect. So, I'm really excited about your book, and I'm really excited to have it on. Um, we're going to put it up for you so people can purchase it directly from Amazon and uh, from your site and everything. That would be great. You know, Dr. Eddie, the logo for the book, if you look at our Facebook page or any kind of our social media, is 21 blades around the human body. And, and the body, the arms are out, the legs are together at the, uh, at the, at the base. But, you know, and um, so one arm is exercise, one is fitness, and the base is spirituality. And the reason there's 21 blades around the, the person's body is it's the, it incorporates the 12 steps, the eightfold path, and the 21st blade represents uh, the higher power of someone's choosing. And so as I, I say in the book, you know, what I tried to do, because I started to recognize early on that the eightfold path is so consistent with 12-step teachings. So I was actually living, you know, a 12-step, uh, excuse me, uh, along the eight, the eightfold path. And so they work so well together because there's such an integration of the concepts, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in Buddhism. You know, I was so grateful. I don't know if you know this about my backup, but I was so grateful. I, I attribute being able to quit smoking, which I stopped two years after quitting alcohol and, uh, you know, and drugs, that I actually flew to Lumbini because I wanted to deliver in person a thank you note to Buddha at, at his place of birth. So I flew to Lumbini, Nepal. Oh wow! And I, yeah, I left the original copy of my book there, and I said thank you because uh, I was starting to write the book, but I was chain smoking as I was yeah. doing it. So I said, "You're a hypocrite. Cut it out, okay?" So <laughs> because I was able to quit smoking, I said, "There's enough hypocrites in the world. You can't write a book about health and a, a healthy lifestyle and recovery and chain smoke while you're doing it. That's ridiculous." So when I when I finally quit smoking and I finished the book in 2015, I took the original manuscript there and I left it as a, as a, as a thank with a thank you note for him, uh, and then I promised. I said, if the book ever gets published, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go to the place where you found enlightenment. 
So in 2018, in October of 2018, I actually went back to buy, uh, to India to the actual spot. Um, there's a temple there now where he attained enlightenment after looking for six years. And I left a copy of my book under the tree of knowledge, which is there at the actual spot and a, a, a new thank you note as, and as a gift to Buddha, just because I don't believe I would have been able to write the book and accomplish the things I've been able to do unless I had integrated his teachings into my, into my recovery lifestyle. I'm like that much of a believer. I'm really that much of a believer. That's awesome. Well, we are (laughs) so out of time and I'm so glad you came on and our listeners are going to love to hear about all the amazing things you're doing and how do they reach you? How can they reach you? Give us your plugs. Sure. Uh, so they can reach me at, uh, we have a website, spiritualadrenaline.com. We have a Facebook page. We have about 80,000 Facebook fans on that page now. So that's just to search on Facebook. And then we have a smaller, about 1,000 people in a sober active community page. And then the last thing is you can check out our Instagram account. And then one more thing, uh, I also promote sober active communities like Addict to Athlete, like Rock Recovery Fitness, the Phoenix uh, Temperance Training that are organizing all around the country. So you can learn a lot about sober active communities on any of our social media. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, and I appreciate it. We'll get everything up, and you have been listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Callie Estes, where all of our guests have amazing stories and things they have done. We are an inspirational podcast, hoping to make your day better. Have a great day, guys. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1-800-706-0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well. Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. I took a walk down the long road Where they said that I shouldn't go On my way found a reason To wake up another day But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Faith or religion But nothing to show for it No need to Down the dark road Where they said that I shouldn't go I knew the dangers of flying Now I'm so far from silent ground But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do